Welcome everyone and good evening. Uh, it is now six o'clock in Hampton County and time to call Hampton County Council April 18th, 2022 uh, meeting to order. Uh, would you stand with us and uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Hollingsworth if he would uh, give the invocation and uh, Mr. Alexander if he leads us in the pledge. Please join us. Let's bow our heads. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you like we always do to say thank you for allowing us to be in your presence for this meeting. And Heavenly Father, as we as council look at the issues that are before us, the matters that we're going to uh, look at to discuss, give us the wisdom to do what, what we need to be doing in order to make the quality of life and the standard of living better for the people of Hampton County. And Heavenly Father, we do this in your son Jesus' name. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. That brings us down to item three, approval of agenda. Item three point one, Hampton the County Council, April 18, 2022, meeting agenda. What's the pleasure, Council? Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the agenda. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, uh, Mr. Weir, if you don't mind, we're supposed to strike item 7.2. Strike 7.2. I'll second that. All right, a motion's been made and it's properly seconded that we uh, approve the uh, Hampton County Council April 18, 2022 meeting agenda. Um, all in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Opposed, likewise, that I have it. Brings us down to item 4, public hearings. We have no public hearings this evening. Uh, item five, public comments. Do we have any public comments? who were able to come out to the Easter egg hunt and I thought that was fun. It was a big success. We really appreciate the support. Um, my name is Tanya Peoples. I'm the director of the Hampton County Recreation Department for those of you who do not know me. And I come before you tonight, councilman, to change the headlines. I would like to share with you the origination of the Hampton County Recreation Department chapter of the National Police Athletic League. The Police Athletic League was established over 70 years ago and now has over 300 member chapters throughout the United States, including the U.S. Virgin Islands, serving youth from ages 5 to 18. This league creates an opportunity to involve police officers as coaches and mentors in a multitude of sports and activities, creating a positive image that these young people will carry with them through the rest of their lives. Based on the conviction of young people, if they, reach, if they are reached early enough, they can cultivate strong, positive attitudes towards law enforcement in their journey through life, with the goal being that of maturity, inclusiveness, and good citizenship. Studies have shown that if a young person engages and interacts with a law enforcement on the baseball field, gym, or classroom, the youth will likely come to respect the laws that police officers enforce. Such respect is beneficial to the youth, the police officer, the neighborhoods, and the business community. The National Association of Police Athletic League Incorporated exists to aid in preventing of juvenile crime and violence by providing mentorship, civic service, athletic recreation, enrichment, and educational opportunities, and resources to membership chapters. As a membership-based organization, National PAL seeks to provide its chapters with resources and opportunities to aid them within their organizational growth, as well as to assist them with the pursuits of showcasing their unique programs and enhance the quality of individual youth engagement experiences. These resources may include funding opportunities, through various grants, 
general liability protection options, programming opportunities through partner organizations, as well as goods and services provided by corporate partners and supported like-minded organizations. In addition, there are occasions when National Power provides chapter members opportunities or access to engage their athletes in select tournaments, clinics, showcases, the construction of events aimed at providing competitive championship outcomes, fundamental enhancements, relationships, building opportunity between kids, cops, and community. I have put together an informational packet for each of you, which explains in greater details the working of this league, as well as information about the national conference, which will be held from May the 31st to June the 3rd of this year. I do understand this is short notice, but if it was possible, I would welcome the opportunity to put together a delegation to attend and bring a wealth of information back to this county and like they say, get this ball on a roll. I come before you tonight not alone, not with just an idea, but with the encouragement and support from people who have a strong record of community involvement, commitment to public service, and the dedication and perseverance that it takes to make something of this magnitude a reality for the children of this county. It takes a village to reach all 18 precincts, and we have a village. In your packet, you will each find a letter of support from each of the following. Some were present, some have sent representatives to represent their department, and some could not be present. Hampton County Sheriff, Mr. T.C. Smalls, Yamasee Police Department, Chief of Police, Mr. Gregory Alexander, Estill Police Department, Chief of Police, Mr. A.D. Williams, Hampton Police Department Assistant Chief of Police, Mr. Troy Long, and Ms. Michelle Saki is here to represent that department. Varnville Police Department, Chief of Police, Mr. Tyrone Smith, and Ms. Linda Gordon, who is the sitting chairwoman of the Hampton County Parks and Recreation Commission. Mr. Charlie Grant, our community outreach coordinator, and I do hope I have your support as well. Thank you. Council. My name is uh, Jake Bertelson, a uh, resident right here in Hampton. Uh, I'm also a member of the County Airport Commission. I've uh, been involved in aviation one capacity or another for 23 years. Uh, 20 years active duty Air Force, three years as a civilian contractor, and uh, now approximately one year as a pilot. Uh, our airport here was 100% responsible for getting me started with fulfilling a lifelong dream of flying an airplane and now currently owning and hiring an airplane right here in Hampton. Um, my purpose here tonight was to address the executive session matter that's scheduled for later on this evening regarding the settlement uh, with Company 2 and using our uh, only runway to uh, test fire apparatus. Uh, my concern is primarily this matter of safety regarding the use of these apparatus in an unscheduled manner at speed on an airfield that's not exactly controlled. It relies exclusively on pilots communicating with other pilots as well as personnel on the ground. Not all of the aircraft that operate here are even necessarily required to operate with radios. Um, additionally, my concern relates to the wear and tear on a runway that if anybody that's flown into Hampton has ever made a complaint about our field, it's that we have a rough runway. And with the county's continued support, we do hope to resurface that runway sooner rather than later. Currently, the state has a large amount of grant money available if we are, are willing to chip in our small percentage to, uh, to pay for the resurfacing. This resurfacing will improve the structural integrity as well as the smoothness of the runway. However, operating, and I cannot speak to the, the weight of the apparatus being tested, uh, the weight and the speed of these vehicles being aggressively accelerated and decelerated on the runway, especially in its current condition, I believe will destroy this runway in a very short period of time. Now this offer does detail that uh, damages will be paid for by Company 2 in the event that they occur, but my concern is beyond just asphalt and labor. 
My concern is also about time. Aircraft owners don't want to sit there for a month, two months, three months while a contract is hammered out, while materials are being sourced, and while the field is being resurfaced. Meanwhile, my aircraft, 15 other aircraft are stranded in their hangars. What are those owners going to do when they can't use their airplanes? They're going to break their leases. They're going to take those aircraft somewhere else, and now this county can no longer make those payments. Once we can't make the loan payments to uh, keep up with our hangar improvements, with our airfield improvements, well, we run the risk of losing the airport. And as uh, anybody that's read this agreement knows, first right of refusal to purchase that facility goes to company two. This, this should alarm us. The tone of language used in this letter, and this is just my opinion here as, a, as an individual, I'm not an attorney, is aggressive and threatening in nature. It is basically saying, settle this agreement in accordance with our terms or we will hold you hostage and spend every dollar of this county's money that we can wring out, regardless of the outcome, right or wrong. We will take as much money out of Hampton County for this suit. That strikes me as wrong. That strikes me as borderline extortion. Maybe that's too strong a word in this case, but that's just me as a person. Uh, my, my end game for this is don't let threats of money or being out muscled sway your decision to keep what we have been building and have invested so much in over the years. We're seeing a massive increase in traffic. We're drawing overflow traffic from major events. The RBC Harriers, the Masters in Augusta, we are seeing overflow aircraft. We just recently had an aircraft land Destined for Hilton Head, refuel, I think, over 400 gallons of Jet A because we are just that much cheaper. We are a more desirable fuel stop for inbound aircraft than some of these larger facilities. We can be the reliever for these large facilities, but we have to keep our runway open. We have to keep this field in good condition. We have to keep building. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioner Jones. Evening, Council. Uh, I'll address a couple of the concerns that this gentleman had. Uh, before this gentleman became part of Hampton County Airport Commission, uh, he's not aware that I used this airport runway testing my airport fire trucks for 12 years with no damage whatsoever. Uh, and I also uh, would like to address the situation about the weight limit of these trucks. The weight limit of these trucks on a per square inch is less than the vehicles that you personally drive today on a per square inch basis. There is, there is, uh, is there a possibility that, uh, that uh, the vehicle can tear up a piece of the property? I, I'm sure there is. I'd be, I'd be naive to sit here and tell you that it, that it isn't, but we've used these, this runway for 12 years with no damage whatsoever. I think in 12 years you would have you would have uh, received a letter, a phone call, or anything concern uh, with concern of uh, any damage toward the property. But with that being said, I've spoken, I've uh, had a conversation with uh, your attorney Algie Solomon several years ago, and he stated that, and, and Bob, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he said that a contract can be drawn up for insurance purposes to cover any damages. Uh, that being said, uh, I could sit here and go through the, through the conversations and the, the legalities of this. FAA has given their approval for what I'm doing for you to allow me to do this, and so is the South Carolina Aeronautics. It's only a win-win for Hampton County to allow me to do what we're doing. I understand that there are several people here in the audience that are with the airport commission and they're fighting this tooth and nail and I totally understand why. We could sit here and, and, and hash that out if you like, but I only have three or four more minutes. But that being said, uh, I appreciate you uh, discussing the uh, settlement of this issue and to further expand on what this gentleman just said about me holding this county hostage. I am not holding this county hostage. What I basically stated was, and I'll state it again, that I am going to see this through to the end. We can put a stop to this tonight if county council decides to work out some sort of agreement with me to use it. You can put a stop to it tonight. This county has already spent $135,000 in attorney's fees and actually in excess of that. It is unnecessary for this to go on any further. 
And I believe that the five of you have the opportunity to put a stop to it tonight and work out some sort of agreement. Do you have to follow my proposal, uh, you know, word for word? No, you don't. You can actually come back to me and come back with some sort of agreement that we can try to work this out. Other than that, uh, if, I have, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. I would I I have that in the in the uh, file with your and you have a f copy of that as well, uh, Mr. Bishop, uh, it, on a per square inch basis. And the reason I say per square inch is one of the airport commissioners came up several years ago before the lawsuit got into court and said that our vehicles were too heavy for this type of airport. It's made for index um, runways, and there's no doubt that these airport these airport fire trucks are designed for those but are actually used on this type of airport as well. And so they requested to know the, the weight per square inch and that's what we gave them on the very largest truck that we have, we gave them that. And if you need, I'll be glad to supply that. Take me about 20 minutes to run, go get it. But that being said, uh, you have a copy of it as well in your file. And the reason I asked you to reference the Knights, I thought you maybe you had a number with you. Didn't, no, I, do, I didn't know that was going to come up tonight. If, I, if I'd have had an idea that, you know, other uh, members of the airport council uh, were going to sit here and, and, and discuss that, I would have brought that information with me. So with your permission, I will go ahead and walk you through it, this, this publication a little bit. The first, as you, as you open up the uh, publication, you see a, a building um, on the right-hand side. That's the new Culinary Institute of the South. 
uh, recently opened uh, by the college in Buckwalter in um, Bluffton. It's, a, uh, it's been a project that's been a long time coming, but badly needed to train culinarians and hospitality students from our service area, which of course includes Hampton, Jasper, uh, Culleton, and Beaufort counties. It was a big project, about $15.5 million, and we're up and running now. We've got about, um, I don't know, we have probably 100 students here. We have capacity for about 350, so we're working our way up. Um, we are working very, di very diligently on dual enrollment students for that program. Uh, those are students that, uh, I, what I say, study once, get credit twice. Uh, those are high school students that are getting credit for both high school and um, college. And we're, and you'll, you'll hear a bit more about what we're doing with Culleton, or with, Buf with uh, Hampton School District in our, in our efforts for uh, dual enrollment. The next uh, item I'd like to point out is this one here on the right, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a new program essentially for us. We've actually had it for a while, but it's getting a lot, a lot of emphasis and attention now. Um, there's over half a million uh, jobs available right now in, in this country for cybersecurity specialists. We currently have four programs online and we're working towards a bachelor's, uh, baccalaureate, a uh, associate degree. And you know what, it's free. We're giving, giving it away, the tuition is free. Just like right now, currently, at TCL, almost every program we have is no, no cost tuition. And that's through a, a combination of different funding sources, but this is a terrific time to go to school. Anybody you know that wants to come to college, this is the time to do it. Um, the next thing I wanna point out is a, called the Foodzium, it's right here. It's a component within inside of the Culinary Institute of the South. It's unique to our area. And it showcases and educates uh, the food history of the south, the southeast, especially the Low Country. And in here we have we've hired some terrific staff. Uh, we have right here in this picture uh, Chef Kevin uh, Mitchell, and he's working as uh, instructor and advisor uh, for our program. I want to shift just a bit more now to continue education. If you flip the page over, I keep hitting this mic. I apologize. Um, to these two pages right here in this book. And Mary Lee Carnes, who's my advancement vice president, is also my continuing education um, responsibility. She's responsible for continuing education within this uh, job. And um, it's particularly relevant to Hampton County, I think, in these programs, um, because we offer in a relatively short period of time uh, we can take people and give them industry recognized certifications and workforce. And again, the majority of the training is free. There's no cost to it. But I like to say we can take someone from a um, minimum wage to a good living wage in a very short period of time. Um, one of the most successful programs we have here at the Lungeon Center is our CDL program. Uh, we just recently uh, rented, leased two new trucks. Three new trucks. We can tell them about the third. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're actually we're actually training. How many how many students would you say? There are eighty nine students in the CDL program. Uh, how many? Eighty nine. Mm -hmm. And again, this is a great example of how you can take somebody from making uh, minimum wage and up to eighty thousand dollars starting uh, for a CDL driver. Uh, that's what that's what Walmart's paying right now, and there's not enough people to fill mm -hmm. those positions in a relatively short period of time, just a few weeks. Uh, we are about to um, uh, begin on a driving pad. Right now, those students are trying to uh, learn to drive in a parking lot. Not a good thing, not a good situation. Um, it's not good for safety, it's not good for them. But we have a DOT-approved uh, pad that's uh, been um, recently approved by the state engineer and we're about to put it up for bids. So we think we'll be able to uh, start construction on that pad this summer. And that pad will be approximately a $350,000 uh, outlay, I believe. Um, also, and uh, Marilyn, you can jump in on this, one of the best parts about here is we're gonna be able to uh, have students uh, get their testing right here. They don't have to travel to Atlanta or Columbia or somewhere to be tested to, for their final licensure. 
And we can also do the recertification of CDO truck drivers right here in, on this site once we get that pad put in. And it's all right here at our Hampton Center, in the Mudgeon Center. Did I miss anything on that? Very yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Mr. Goff. Yes, sir. If you don't mind, I just, uh, a little passionate about your CDO program. I had a conversation with a young man the other day. Would you mind if I share it? Please. Um, they had been generationally below the poverty line. And he found out <clears throat> it was after your presentation last year about the CDO program. I made sure they got the information to, and that he was looking for something. And they participated. It's transforming. It transforms their lives and their children's lives. It's just a, it's an incredible way for a, an individual to, to, to do well in a very relatively short period of time. There are some requirements. You have to, you know, you have to have uh, uh, drug-free. You have to have a clean driving record. But once those and a, and a physical, and once those things are overcome, you're clear to start start training. Mr. Sure. I'm I'm sorry for for getting this, but Council and Bishop, thank you for for reminding me. We are also buying um, DDL simulators, uh, SIPs. And what these can <coughs> do is that juniors and seniors in the high school who have to be 18 in order to get in the pad can start the first half of the, of the program because it's classroom and it's a, it's a little bit uh, experiential, but it's not on the road. So they can start kind of, let's call it technical dual enrollment, not dual enrollment for credit, but be in high school and start working towards, so when they, you know, a, a, a CDL licensure, when they graduate, they just have to end you know, the, the last part, which will be in the truck itself. So that's about, that's about a $30,000 investment in the software to, to do that. But that, that's the only way we can, we can reach into the high schools. And, and I should uh, shout out to Dr. Wilcox and his his team and staff because they work closely with us uh, in that in that in that program and as well as a lot of other programs. Um, lastly, um, I would just like to skip to the um, some TCL uh, Hampton fast facts. There's a sheet in your uh, packet that lists some of those. Merrily, you want to run through those? So we put together the facts fact sheet because this is what is most important to council and, and those, those here present. Uh, and as Dr. Golf said, at this time, and we don't know for how long, but at this time, South Carolina residents can attend the college and the career and technical programs for free. CDL is free. Uh, the CNA classes that um, do well at the Hampton uh, campus are free. We put, we put in more CNA classes, we put in more phlebotomy classes, and they too are, are free. But we wanted to list to, for you, um, the classes that are available here at the Hampton ca uh, campus, but also those that are live online. You know, since COVID, a lot of things went online. Our commitment is live online. That means a South Carolina resident anywhere, um, this is not self-paced, there is an instructor, but this takes, is taking place online. And residents of Hampton County can use the Hampton campus uh, computer labs to attend these. I think most of them kind of start at 6 or 7 p.m. Um, and you can find more about those in our, um, uh, on our website. Down at the bottom, right now in the continuing edu education program at the Hampton campus, we have 102 students attending continuing education programs. So that's the CDL, that's the phlebotomy, that's the, the CNA. Uh, College-wide enrollment uh, from Hampton County residents is 179. Stepping back in that 102 number, that 102, not all those students are Hampton County residents. And I, in fact, I would tell you, we know, 59 are Hampton County Latino residences. Um, College-wide, uh, 179 residents of, of Hampton County attend the Technical <coughs> College of the Low Country, and this past fall, 80 students from ha uh, Hampton County were uh, enrolled in the credit-bearing 
um, and 40 Hampton County High School students were enrolled in the dual enrollment uh, uh, program. And then, of course, it is our responsibility to tell you how much it cost us to run the Hampton campus, and that's about $455,000 annually uh, for the cost of operations at, at the Munchen Center. It's always been a strong site for CNA and phlebotomy also. Uh, in fact, we're adding more phlebotomy, phlebotomy classes. If, if we should remind council that it was only last March, March 2021, that our campus opened again. Closed you know, for two years. Yeah, and that was a state mandate that closed all our campuses, and that closes every campus of ours. Rupert Mata campus, the New River campus and the <coughs> Hampton campus here. So we're coming back online quickly. I think 102 in CE at Hampton is a strong number, and it's growing. Um, to have 40 in dual enrollment and 80 in the uh, credit bearing program, those, those numbers are recovering. College-wide, we're recovering, um, but we're recovering um, at pace in Hampton County also. We uh, recently um, were able to uh, I guess you'd call it a grant, it's a state appropriation for $1.2 million to, uh, to provide high school, college, dual enrollment technical credit programs, which we're doing with uh, Whithampton, and we're also doing it in Jasper County. But that'll be a three-year grant, so we have about $600,000 a year to spend. We're just beginning to use that grant. And it uh, will allow us to purchase uh, equipment, uh, hire instructors, and pay tuition for the students. So that tuition for those students will be uh, free for at least for the next three years for sure, no matter what else happens at the college. And I think it might also be important to remind council, maybe inform council, that the college also supports a counselor in the, uh, in the school district, that we pay for that. Mm -hmm that salary for an instructor in the school district to advise students, particularly on, on dual, dual enrollment. And just another aside, we hope to the beginning of the fall semester to have the, the pad completely done, the new trucks all washed, and we hope to have our, uh, we're confident you all will attend a, a Hampton County community ribbon cutting for that program. And we will be able to look at the simulators and be introduced to so a lot of good things happen right now. Um, we're looking at adding more medical programs. Uh, PCT, patient care, patient care technician, for one, medical assisting is uh, available. Additionally, um, when, in, when the uh, agricultural technical campus begins to take place, we're working with the state, Ready SC, to train those workers. Uh, we expect that to <coughs> be a training for upwards of a thousand people to some some level, and it will be uh, taking place over a course of more than one year, plus the ongoing training. So we're, we're planning ahead for that to happen, and we're prepared to uh, move with that once, once, the, once that uh, organization takes off. Any questions for me? And I, I think it's important that, um, and I have been in this, and I probably should be reprimanded for this, but one of my bosses is here in the audience, Doc Small, Dr. William Small, he's a uh, representative from... Not a boss. Yeah. <laughs> he's Not a boss. He, he writes my evaluation, so I, I feel like he's a boss. Then we have, of course, uh, Mr. Clay Bishop, who's your recently appointed liaison to the college. And I think he'll be with us tomorrow morning during our uh, first, first area commission meeting here at Munchen Center. And of course, it's an open meeting any of you would like to attend at 9 o'clock. Yes, sir. On the uh, ACT Agriculture Technology Center. Yes, sir. I think that um, we good in for the real spur. That haven't come across yet. So. When did you say the quick the training gonna stop for the ACT? Well, we we work with the state, Ready SC, and we work with the companies to, for them to tell us when they want the training to start. It'll be pre-employment training and post-employment training. So 
whenever they're ready to begin, I, I think you'll see sometime around six months in advance of them actually starting to hire those individuals, and then post-training will continue after that. So it's really up to them um, when, when, we want to, when they want us to begin, but we're prepared to start. But we, we understand that's been postponed a little longer than what we had all hoped. Because um, I know that was a big announcement last year. It, it was, sir, and we, we expected actually to start training in January, but um, of course that didn't happen. But we're prepared to begin whenever they're ready for us. We appreciate your preparedness. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you for your Thank time. You.
continues on improvements out there. I hope things went very, very well with that. <laughs> the, well, one thing, <coughs> the, uh, the one on Friday afternoon we did for the, the system of challenge young people. And that was absolutely phenomenal to watch. I think it's the first time we've ever done one like that. And those, the children wanted no help from the parents. I mean, they were out there on their own, and it just went fantastic. So, uh, uh, Ms. Johnny put together, I know she was here, so we here, put together a great program, and it was well attended. Thank you. That brings us down to item 13. For this year, I forgot. I wanted to bring you up today. Okay. The, the gun range issues, um, I've looked into a couple of things at the request of Ms. Fennell. Now, taking into consideration 
the what was due to other clubs. That was seven hundred and sixty seven thousand seven hundred and eighty six dollars. And then also that year was the first year we see the sheriff's fund, um, which was fund one twenty eight showing a deficit of one hundred and two thousand five hundred and fifteen dollars. So the net reserves were eleven percent or one million two hundred and fifty five thousand six hundred dollars. So the general fund reserve did not include outstanding balances due to other funds. What council has done going forward, they have restricted those funds. So when we do build the fund balance, those funds are restricted and they will have that amount of money. Now we will have to look at making sure that we keep the due to under funds, other funds under control. We have made some changes to make things different but those funds will be segregated so that dollar amount will be there and it won't be owed to anyone else. But we will have to monitor are there any deficits or due to other funds to make sure it's the actual reserves, the net reserves. And I have attached copies of all the sheets referencing the information that I provided.